hey, there's a new AI image generator available, and I don't want to wait for the frameworks to catch up and make it available for me. I want to access it now. So let's take a look. I'm going to access it in Java, and in a companion video, I'll do the same thing in Kotlin to see what extra features that adds. Welcome to Tales from the Jar Side. Welcome. My name is Ken Cousin, and on Tales from the Jar Side, I try to give you expert advice on topics related to Java, Kotlin, Spring, AI, and related topics. Let's take a look. So here was the announcement from Black Forest Labs. That's the name of the company. Black Forest Labs that has their new Flux 1.1 Pro image generator. Now that's interesting, but normally I wouldn't have jumped on that. What's neat from my point of view is now there's an API. Now we have a programmatic interface and therefore can write code to it. So when I scroll down to the part about the API, it says our new beta API, all the more reason, by the way, why the various frameworks like langchain for j or Spring AI, probably wait until it's out of beta at least. At any rate, our new beta brings Flux's capabilities directly to developers and businesses looking to integrate state-of-the-art image generation into their own applications. Motherhead and apple pie stuff. So they've got various good things about it, but the part I'm interested in is that it's only four cents an image. Now that's quite competitive. That's what Dolly 3 charges you also is four cents an image and Stable Diffusion has their own way of doing things. So to get started, you go to docs.bfl, blackforestlabs.ml. And that is this page. So they say this is in beta, so subject to change. Yeah, we get it. So you have to create an account and that took me a couple tries. I got to admit it, the system didn't work right right away but eventually i made an account and then they give you 50 credits and 50 credits is worth 12 and a half images because a credit is a penny and four credits per image is four cents an image and there you go now i put in my 10 bucks or whatever and therefore i can make lots and lots of images and if i go below whatever the minimum is i'll just probably charge it up again so I'm going to skip the creating account, managing your account. If I go to creating your first image using our API, they show that they have three separate endpoints. The one that I want is this Flux Pro 1.1. There's the older Flux Pro and then Flux Dev, and there's even a Flux Schnell, although apparently not available in the API. And here they show some Python code. I do want to look at this for a moment just to give you an idea about one interesting feature. In the Python code, they're sending a post request to the endpoint, and their headers are sending an accept header and a content type header, normal stuff, saying we're sending and receiving applications last JSON data. No big surprise there. However, here they're using a custom header called x-key. So instead of using some standard authorization header like so many of them do, they made their own header. And what they want you to do is take your key and put it as an environment variable called bfl underscore api underscore key. Then they have a prompt and a width and a height and they go back and this is the part that's different. They are returning an ID. So the request comes back almost right away. It schedules the image generation, but it doesn't give me back the image. Instead, you get back an ID. And then what you have to do is pull for the result. So they have a different endpoint for actually getting the image. You have to call the get result endpoint with the ID from the request previously as part of a query string. Again, sending your key and everything. And then the result is going to have a status property that will go through various values, which are waiting for it to be ready. And then inside that status, there'll be a result. And inside the result, there's a sample. And that's the URL for the image. So if you think about it, there's at least three steps involved here. One is to go and request the image, and that'll give you back an ID. Two is to then pull the endpoint with the ID, waiting for the status to be ready. We have an image. And three is then to use that URL and download the resulting image. Now they say, if you wanna look at details, look at the full reference documentation. 
and that's here. Now, one notable thing about the reference documentation is that they do document their REST API using an open API specification. So we used to call Swagger. So they have that mechanism for you. The other thing to notice is this is not one of those AIs that gives you a Python library or a, some special library that, that hides all the networking and everything under the hood. This is a straight REST API. You do post and get requests and you create your objects and serialize them to JSON data and deserialize the results. So we could look at it here, but I've already imported it into IntelliJ. Let's go take a look over there. Here is the open API document, that JSON document that describes everything. And here's the little get result mechanism that's gonna take the ID as an argument and give us back a response that's gonna have the ID and a status, and there's a list of status elements and then a result, and here they get a little vague, and, and that's the part I expect will probably change in the future. I had to run it in order to see what we actually get out of that. Now that's after you've already generated the ID, so down here is the generate an image with Flux 1.1 Pro. The request has the following fields. A prompt is required, width and height, which default to 1024 by 768. They must be multiples of 32, believe it or not. And they range between 256 is the low end and 1440 on the upper end. You can also put in this thing called a prompt upsampling or a seed or a safety tolerance. The seed is used for reproducibility. So if you put in the same seed over and over again, you get the same image back. The safety tolerance ranges from zero for the strictest version and six for the least strict. Kind of the opposite of what I would have thought, but okay. And the default's a two for what it's worth. So the only thing that's required is the prompt and everything else has some defaults in it. Now the response you get back will be an ID. All right, let's take a look at the code. Now when I do mappings, I start with the input and the output structure. So I'm using Java records, because why not? And I like to put all my records in one file. So I made a class that I just called BFL records, just to hold all the individual records. And I'll statically import that class so I don't need to qualify all my records with BFL records dot in all the code. So here's my image request with all six of those properties. And honestly, that would be enough. But for convenience, I added a constructor that takes just the prompt, the width, and the height and sets the others to some default. And I added a constructor that takes just the prompt and set all the rest. Also, this special little thing here is called a compact constructor in Java. And the idea there is that it does validation for you. Notice there's no parentheses on that one at all. And all of the instantiation of image requests will go through this. And I can check here, was the width in the right range? Was it divisible by 32? Same thing with the height. And then if the safety tolerance is provided, is it also in the right range? And all of those will throw an exception if they're not. So that's an easy way to programmatically enforce all of those requirements and I'll have to remember them from the documentation. The other ones are really, really simple. If you look at the response from the initial call to the image generation, it just gives you an object that wraps an ID and they called it in their system async response. So I'll call it that here as well. Then the response from the get result one, the API response has an ID and a status and a result. And the status, first of all, I made an enum there's all the individual possibilities out of the status. And the result, I made a child element here that has a sample. And from some experimentation, I found out it also will give you back your prompt. I'm going to keep an eye on that because sometimes these things will rewrite your prompt for you. Dolly 3 does that all the time. Okay, let's go look at the service. So the image generation service starts here. And I set the base URL, and this is using system.getm to retrieve my key. I also need a JSON parser. At the moment, I'm using Google's JSON. Seems simple enough. Also, it converts the lowercase with underscores in the JSON data into camel case in my Java, so I don't have to worry about that either. So the first step is to send in my prompt and get back an ID. So I'll just say the client will create one of those image request objects and I will convert it to a string, serialize it to a string here. 
and now I'll use the HTTP client that came in Java 11, and I'll build up a request that goes to the proper endpoint, set the accept and content type headers the way they suggested, and the X key header, and I will post my request using the body as a string inside it. So this is the send method, which sends a synchronous request, and I get back a response, which I will extract a body from and convert it to that async response guy so that I can just return the ID. So this looks more complicated than it is. It's Java. It just tends to be verbose. All I did was create a client, submit the request with a body, I get back the async response and pull the value out. Down here, now I'm going to pull for the results. So this is the part that can get tricky. I put in the request ID and I make a client again. And this time my HTTP request is going to the get result endpoint with that ID. Again, set the accept header. There's no content type this time because I'm not sending anything. I'm just sending a, a query string. I'm not transmitting any JSON data. It's just a GET request. There's the key. And here's the part where I'm doing my polling. I have a while true loop. Might want to think about that in the long run, but it's worth a try here, where I'll send the response and get back the API response, deserialize the body into that, and now I can get the status, and here's my switch statement for the status. If we're done, if we got ready, well, wonderful. I'll extract the result, and if it's not blank, I'll print the prompt. I'll just check the prompt to see if it changed. But the important part is that the sample's got the URL in it of the generated image. I'll show you in a moment. I wrote a method to download that and save it separately. The other possibilities here, these are all error conditions. The task wasn't found, it failed, or some unknown error. And then here is where the polling tells me, oh, you're just not ready yet. So if the request is either pending or in progress, I'll sleep for half a second, 500 milliseconds, print out something to let me know it's waiting. And because I didn't return anything, it will continue the loop. This is how I break out of the loop. A refinement to this would be to not let it run forever, to have some sort of mechanism to break after 10 seconds or something like that. The last method is to download and save image. So what I did there is I have the URL, and I'm going to have to do a, a request again, but I want to save all these responses into separate files. So I'm going to generate a timestamp and make a file name that says generated image and the timestamp on it .jpg. This service from experimenting always returns JPEGs. So that way I can keep track of all my images and know when I generated them and everything. Now I'm gonna convert that into a path, the Java new IO .path under source main resources. So when I create my client and create my request, now I can transmit that request, but this time, the response is bodyhandlers.ofFile. See, what a file will do is it'll take the data that came back and save it directly to the file. So this is the most efficient way I can think of to save that information. If everything worked, then I'll say image saved successfully too and give the path. Otherwise, I'll throw an IO exception. So let's take a look at the test. Now, I have tests for the records as well to validate all of the individual constraints in there, and I'm not going to go over that, but they're all in the GitHub repository, and they're fine. So what I really want is to run it. So I did say on my test in JUnit 5, this is only enabled if that BFL API key is found in the environment. So that's a neat little mechanism in JUnit 5, enabled if environment variable only. But assuming it is, then what I'll do is I'll instantiate the service. I'll create a request, and I'm creating a request of a stochastic parrot. That's supposed to be a joke. AI tools are often referred to as stochastic parrots. They're just repeating what they've heard, and it's all random, and they don't have any idea what they're talking about. And yeah, somehow that seems appropriate. So I'll request the image generation, get back my ID, which shouldn't be null. Then I'll pull for the result, which will give me back the eventual file name that I got. Once it's working, it will download the file and tell me where it was saved. And that's the whole thing. 
So let me run this test and see what we get. And this is quite typical. I'm getting this task is pending every half second. It takes a second and a half to two seconds in this case to run. Normally they take about a second and a half to two seconds. And that prompt was returned as a stochastic parrot and the image was saved successfully. So let's take a look at the image and there's our stochastic parrot. So very nice, very colorful. Uh, let me show you some other images while we talk about the rest of this. The prompt for this one was a warrior cat rides a dragon into battle. And I got a few of those. There's a different stochastic parrot. This one, I turned on the prompt up sampling. I don't really know what that does, but I ran it and I got a very colorful picture. So, okay, that's nice. And this one and the next one were dogs riding a sea serpent. I thought that would be entertaining as well. So there's the basic process. Everything's in the GitHub repository. I'll put a link in the description, but it all worked and I didn't have to wait for the frameworks to incorporate this into it. It was just a question of setting up the networking, setting up the JSON parsing, defining the records so that I could validate them and transmitting the requests and polling for the responses. And it all worked like a charm. So I hope you like that. I am gonna have a companion video where instead of using the regular requests with a poll, I'm going to do the whole application in Kotlin so I could take advantage of coroutines. So that will be coming very soon. Look for that in the future. Subscribe so you don't miss it. Take care, everybody.